Psalm 46, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth changes, though the mountains are shaken into the heart of the seas, though its waters roar and are troubled, though the mountains tremble with their swelling, there is a river, its streams delight the city of God, the holy place of Elyon. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her at the turning of the morning. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He lifted his voice, and the earth melted. Yehovah Svaot is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of Yehovah, who brings desolation on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots in the fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yehovah Svaot is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Father, we thank you as we come together this morning that you are our refuge and you are our strength. We thank You that You are our high tower. You are our shield. We thank You that in the times in which we live that we are hidden underneath the shadow of the Almighty in the secret place of the Most High. We dwell there. We live there in union with You. We thank You for uniting us to Yourself by Your Spirit, making us one with You. Lord, for giving us the understanding of the good news of the Gospel. Thank You for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank You for reconciling us to Yourself. Thank You for redeeming us, rescuing us. Thank You for making us perfectly holy, perfectly pure in every way. Thank You for cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Thank You that... As we are before You, we stand before You as a free people in Christ. That There is no earthly kingdom or government that can tell us we're free. Your Word declares our freedom. We thank You that we've been sealed by Your Spirit. We've been gifted by Your Spirit. We pray Your blessing upon our time together. That those who have joined us here and by means of the internet, we pray Your blessing upon each one. And pray that You would give us all the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of You. May the eyes of our understanding be open and lightened that we might know the hope to which we have been called to and the hope in which we stand. That we might know the riches of the glorious inheritance that we have in You and we are to You. And that we will know by experience the exceeding greatness of Your power towards us who believe. I ask that in each person's life, whatever their needs may be, you would do exceeding and abundantly above and beyond all that they could ask or think according to your power that's at work within them. We ask all of these things in your Son's name and for His sake. Amen. Turn around wave at each other this morning. Let each other know you're glad to see one another. Good to have everybody here. We're going to be standing this morning. If you want to stand and join us as we sing, there's power in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ His sacrificed for us, having saved us and redeemed us from all of our sins. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you all reveal a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to keep 
Calvary's blood. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin saints are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Isn't it good to know this morning as you stand here, you stand perfectly clean. I mean, it doesn't matter what's happened. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. And it's not because of my goodness or my badness or your goodness or your badness. We stand perfect this morning, perfectly clean before God. That ought to make you feel really good, no matter what's going on, how you stand before Him right now. That's reality in all of our lives. And because of that, we have been given victory through Jesus. I heard an old, old story How my Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sin and I won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. Victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew. And all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. We have victory because of the love of God for us. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bound down with care, God gave His Son to win. His erring child He reconciled and pardoned from His sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones, 
and kingdoms fall when men here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so sure shall still endure all measure less and strong redeeming grace to Adam's race the saints and angels song O love of God, how rich and pure, how measured less and strong. It shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels' song. Could we with thee the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made? Every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O love of God, how rich and pure! How measureless and strong It shall forevermore endure The saints and angels Let's sing the chorus again O love of God, how rich and pure How measureless and strong It shall forevermore endure The saints and angels Father, we thank you for your love. We do thank you for the love that reached down and rescued us, redeemed and saved us. And thank you, Father, that there is no way that we will ever be able to plumb the depths of how much you do love us. That we will spend the ages and ages to come discovering new depths to that love, new heights, new widths and breadths to it. We'll never be able to come to the end of it, how great Your love is for us. And we thank You, Father, that this love, this victory that we've sung about this morning through the blood and the sacrifice of Yourself, Your Son, on the cross has given us absolute and complete and total victory over the villain in the story of redemption. We pray that You will help us to see and understand the Word as we read this morning, as we talk and share. We pray that our hearts would be open to receive from You. Be very aware of the battle that we're in and the war that we are in the midst of. But already thanking You that we we, we fight from a place of victory. Not to gain it. Not to move toward it. But from it. And in it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Let's uh, open up our Bibles to the 12th chapter of the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look again this morning a little bit more at the villain we started talking about last week that was introduced to us. In the third chapter of Genesis, in the midst of the Garden of Eden, this fallen cherub that rebelled against God, we're not given uh, any real understanding of when this rebellion took place. There are a lot of theories out there when Satan's rebellion took place. There are some that say that this rebellion took place between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, and There's a theory among theologians called the gap theory uh, that says there was a space of who knows how many ages between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, and that somewhere in that time period that there was a rebellion that took place that Satan led against God. We don't know. We don't know when it happened. We just know that it did. And we know that God's work of creation, when He finished on the sixth day, He declared everything very good. And what he had made here in this present creation. And so this villain is introduced to us. We saw that he was originally a a mighty cherub. 
He had immediate access and nearness to the very presence and throne of God, that he was a beautiful creature, that he was very, very wise, had a great deal of understanding and insight, but at some point in and after his creation, he fell. Pride got the best of him. The Scripture tells us that he became consumed with his own beauty and his own pride, and not only that, he was not content with the position that God had given him in the council, and he decided that he wanted to be the Most High. He wanted to replace God and wanted to sit upon the throne in the sides of the north among the council. He wanted to be the chief among all of the Elohim, that heavenly council that are talked about in Psalm 82. As a result of that, he was cast down. And then he comes into this garden and he tempts Adam and Eve to disobey and rebel against God, to join him, as it were, in his rebellion. And as we said last week, it was no shock for Eve to see this kind of a creature there. Adam and Eve were very much aware of the heavenly council. Maybe they had interaction with them from time to time. So speaking to this being was not a shock to her. After all, they walked with God in the cool of the day. That was their habit. And so when this was suggestion was made and the, 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 the temptation was brought to her to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they also obviously disobeyed, and as a result, death entered into the world. Sin and death came into humanity. This, 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 this nature, this lower nature as it were, this, this, the, this, this, this sense within us that leads us to rebel against God and to disobey Him, it, it entered in, but the key thing was that death was brought into the creation and of course, God cursed the serpent. God cursed the nakash. That's what he was called, this, this cherub. He was cursed to be beneath the earth, as it were. The lower regions. Adam's toil in the earth was increased and in that things wouldn't come up as naturally and as easily as before. The Eve's pain and childbearing was greatly increased. Not to say she wouldn't have experienced any kind of pain prior to that, but it, the Scripture says that God said your pain will be increased, as it were, in the labor and the giving and bringing forth of children. And so this villain starts there that we get introduced to in chapter 3, but he is he runs through the pages of Scripture, but he really gets a great deal of notoriety and attention in the New Testament because his thought, the thought and his understanding of this villain in the Old Testament came to a greater clarification in that second temple period that we've talked about between 500 B.C. and the time of the birth of Jesus. There was a rule, all the nations with a rod of iron, and a child was caught up to God and to His throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that there may be nourished, that there they may be nourished her 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels made war with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels made war, but they did not prevail. And there was no longer a place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that old serpent, he who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even to death. Child, And two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman that she might fly into the wilderness to her place so that she might be nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent spewed water out of his mouth after the woman like a river, that he might cause her to be carried away by the stream. The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river which the dragon spewed out of his mouth. 
And the dragon grew angry with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Those who keep the testimony or the commands of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua or Jesus. This great cosmic battle that John pictures here gives us really an overview of history. But what he says in this passage, he describes this dragon and he finally gets a clear identity that this dragon, this Leviathan, is the old serpent, the one that we're introduced to in Genesis 3. The devil, Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren. He is the arch villain. He is the arch enemy of God. And he is the one who is ultimately, finally, and forever defeated by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, when we engage in battle, and again, whether we realize it or not, we are all involved in this war. We're a part of this conflict. And we have, you, a person, every individual on this planet has to make a decision as to whose side they're on. Everyone. There is no middle ground. There is no Switzerland in the spiritual realm where you say, well, we're not going to be involved either way. It doesn't work that way. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you are against me. That's just his way, the way it is. And as we know, Baptism, as we've talked about in the past, baptism is our public declaration of whose side we've chosen to be on if we have truly made a commitment of faith to follow Jesus. It is our declaration to the unseen realm who we choose to fight for, whose side we are aligning with. And we have confessed Christ as our Lord, as our commander, as our general the one under whom we have given our allegiance and that we are following into battle. But as a result of us being a part of this battle, as we said last week, it's very vital that we understand and we know about this enemy that we face. And so when we come to the New Testament, we saw a number of things last week in the Old Testament Scriptures about him. When we come to the New Testament, we find, again, more development in describing our enemy. In the description of this villain, and the New Testament is mainly given to us through titles and names by which he is called. Because remember, names always will, rep in the Scripture, represent a person or a being's character, their nature, their activity, their purpose in the world. So let's look, if you will, over in the fourth chapter of Luke, and we'll find this first description that is given. And this takes place at the temptation of Jesus after he's been baptized by his cousin John in the River Jordan. And we find an interesting statement here in Luke 4 of immediately after being baptized, what happens? What the Spirit of God does with the Son of God and where he takes him. And it's significant. In, in Luke 4, verse 1, it says, And Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Now, the word for devil there, the idea there is, is the word, it's, a, it's the idea of an adversary. Someone who is an adversarial role against another. They are opposing them. So he has been led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to face the adversary. And it says that he ate nothing in those days. Afterward, when they were completed, he was hungry. And the devil, the adversary, said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The devil then leading him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I want. If you therefore will worship before me, 
it will be yours. Now, that statement, just think about this, gives a whole new meaning to taking a knee before anyone. And Yeshua, Jesus answered him, Get behind me, Satan, adversary, for it is written, You shall worship Jehovah your God, and you shall serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, cast yourself down from here, for it is written, He will put his angels in charge of you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest perhaps you dash your foot against a stone." Jesus answering said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt Jehovah your God. Now when the adversary, the devil, had completed every temptation, he departed from him until another time. Now what's significant about this? Well, one of the things that's significant is we see we have the two main combatants facing off with one another. Face off. It's as if Jesus has entered the Colosseum now as the great heavenly gladiator. And now he is facing the villain, the arch foe of all of humanity. And this foe has been doing everything possible that he could, as we saw in Revelation 12, up until this point in history, dealing with and and, and standing against the people of Israel and the people of God to corrupt Israel humanity to keep this one from coming into the world, but he was not successful. He was not able to do that. Even with, as John said in Revelation 12, how that when this child was born, he was waiting to devour him. Herod slaughtering all the children, the male children of two years and younger, waiting to slaughter him. He did everything he could, but he could not stop. He he knew that, that there was no way he was going to be able to do what he wanted to do and stop the Messiah from coming. And so now they've entered into, but he realizes this being that he's dealing with is fully human. He's not, he's not, you know, some kind of specialized human. He's not an anomaly in the sense that he's like kind of like Superman. He's 100% flesh and blood human being, even though he is God, but he is human. And he knows that, that there, there is something as it were, that he has relinquished as God, that he's no longer using or calling upon as God, even though he had the right to, his privileges that Paul talks about. So he thinks in his own corrupt brain that Jesus is vulnerable. And the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the Colosseum to face him. Now, why the wilderness? Well, remember, as we talked about last week, the Jews believed that the wilderness was the haunt and the place of evil spirits. That that was a, you didn't want to be out in the wilderness. Yeah, people went out and they encountered God out there, but it was also a very bad place. You didn't want to be in the wilderness because that's where the demons lived. That's where they stayed. Jesus indicated that when he cast the demon out of somebody and talked about the, a, a spirit leaving someone and roaming through dry places. The goat Azazel that was sent out into the wilderness, bearing the sins of the people. Because they believed that that's where the demons were. So Jesus is led out into the, the lair, as it were, of the evil one and his hosts. He's out there in the midst. It says he, that Matthew describes he's out there with the wild beasts, as it were. And then these temptations begin to come. Now, what we have to understand is, is that Jesus, when he came, he was a representative. He was a representative of all mankind, right? He represented all humanity. We know that. He's the last Adam. But he also represented the nation of Israel as the perfect and absolute complete Jew. And remember, when Israel was led out of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea they went to the mountain of God. Then they were to, went through a small time of journey in the wilderness to go to the edge of the promised land. And remember, when they got to the edge of the promised land, they sent in the spies. The spies came back with a report about the giants being in there, 
Ten of them said, no, no, no. Joshua and Caleb said, yes. And of course, the people of Israel listened to the ten naysayers, and they did not believe God. As a result, they were judged by God, and they had to wander in the wilderness for how many years? Forty years, because they failed. Jesus comes along, and He is the new Israelite. He is the chosen one. He also goes through. We know that baptism, as Paul tells us, is symbolic of the, of the Red Sea. It's a, it's a picture of the Israel going through the Red Sea. So Jesus is baptized, representing Israel, representing all humanity, turning us, because that was a, it was a baptism of repentance, but Jesus didn't have any sin to be repented of, but he was representing us. So he's turning humanity back to God. He's turning Israel back to God, as it were, as their representative. But then... He is led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, equating to those 40 years in the wilderness that Israel wandered around in. The reason why Israel wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years, we read it the other week in Deuteronomy 32, 15 through 20, God said that they were seduced by demons and doubted God, as a result, they paid the price and the penalty and were not able to enter into the promised land. Jesus goes out into the wilderness, and He's not, he's not in, encountering demons. He's encountering the villain. He's encountering the head one of all, the one in all the, the authority and power that is His as the leader of the hosts of hell. He's engaging Him as the representative of Israel. And the devil, of course, tempts him. His adversary tempts him with his hunger. He tempts him with the authority. And the interest is interesting. Satan says to Jesus, just take, that's all he wanted him to do, was take a knee. That's it. Just take a knee. You don't have to say anything. Just take a knee. And I will give you the authority over all of the kingdoms of this present world because it has been, it's mine to give because I have authority over them. Well, what's interesting is remember, in Genesis 11, when the Tower of Babel came, what did God do? God rejected because men had said, we don't want you, God. God basically disinherited the nations sent them out into the world, they came under the authority, as we saw in Psalm 82, of those Elohim that were not good. And we saw that in, in, in the book of Deuteronomy where it tells us that the nations of the world were under the authority of these evil angelic beings. But Israel was God's inheritance. He chose Israel. And of course, when he did that, Genesis chapter 12, he begins his plan to reclaim those nations for himself by choosing Israel and through Israel sending a Messiah through whom all the nations, as he told Abraham, of the earth would be blessed. They would be reclaimed by the work of the Messiah. And so all this authority of these nations, it's under the rule of these fallen means. Well, what would happen if Jesus had simply taken a knee and would have yielded, he would have failed in the plan of God to bring the nations back to God. Would have failed. God's ultimate intent and purpose in saving the earth would have died in that moment. But he didn't do it. He resisted. And then the temptation to just simply perform, do some miracle, throw yourself off. You'll be caught. Don't worry about it. And Jesus says, you're not tempt. Each time, of course, Satan is attacking his identity, if you really are the Son of God. If you really are. Always trying to trick, to deceive, and being crafty in every single way. He is an adversary. He is your adversary. He is my adversary. The Scripture also tells us in the Gospels that he is referred to as the evil one. Look, if you will, in Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> in Matthew 5. 
talking to Jesus is on the Sermon of the Mount is talking about swearing. And in verse 36, he says, Neither shall you swear by your head, for you can't make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes, your no be no. Whatever is more than these is of the evil one. And even in the what we call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, in verse 13, he says, lead us or bring us not into temptation, but deliver us, when most of the traversions will say deliver us from evil, but literally, it literally means, but deliver us from the evil one. Why? Because this villain is your adversary. He is your enemy, and we meet, need deliverance from him. Evil one means he is the very essence of wickedness, badness, uncleanness. He is evil to the core. And of course, we know throughout the New Testament, he's referred to, as we saw in Revelation 12, as the devil. And that word means a slanderer and an accuser. He accuses us. He says that he was stood before the throne of God, accusing us before our God day and night. He accuses you. He condemns you. He makes you feel and gives you that sense that you, are, you stand condemned, even as a child of God tries to make you feel dirty, unclean, filthy about yourself, all of those things, accusing you and slandering you. And then he's also referred to as Beelzebub. And if you look over in Matthew chapter 12, just a few pages over from Matthew chapter 6 there, the, the Pharisees uh, uh, talked about this and accusing him. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This man does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. Now, Beelzebub is basically tied in and associated with the god Baal, or some people call him Baal, but Baal. Old Testament. Now, guess Baal in the Old Testament worshiped among the Canaanites and all those other nations around Israel. He was the, the, the chief god of the gods on the earth, and he was referred to as the god of the underworld. Remember when we saw that description of the world beneath the, the earth? They saw the ruler of that realm as ba Baal. That's who it was. And so, again, remember when Satan was cursed in the garden last week, God cursed him to the ground, but remember, it wasn't to the earth. Adam was of the earth, but it literally meant the realm beneath the earth, the realm of the dead. Isaiah tells us that. Ezekiel tells us that. So him being referred to as Beelzebub is very apropos. He's the god of the gods of this world, and as it were, the Lord of the dead, the realm of death. Now, this adversary has a dominion. He has a rule. We just read here in Matthew chapter 12, he's referred to as the prince or ruler of demons. He is the, he's number one. He is the prince, and he is the ruler over them. He's also referred to that in Matthew 9, 34. He's the prince of demons. But not only is he the prince and the ruler of demons, and we'll, we'll be talking about that in the next week or two. If you go over to John chapter 12, Jesus tells us, because again, he recognized this about the devil. He is one who has authority and a kingdom has been given to him. Jesus in, in John chapter 12 and verse 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. So not only is he the prince of demons and the ruler of them, he is the ruler of this age, as it were of this present age, of this pre the present systems that are in this age. He is the ruler of it. 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, that the God of this world has darkened the minds of those who don't believe so that they don't see the good news revealed in the face of Jesus. Paul refers to him as the God of this world. The ruler of this world, Jesus, calls him. You see, he has authority and a place of rule and superiority over all of those other Elohim, the bad Elohim that we saw in Psalm 82, who were given authority over the nations of the earth, and they became princes over the nations of the earth, bad princes, but nonetheless, they were given this authority by God in Genesis 11 that, Paul, that Moses tells us about in Deuteronomy. But Satan is the head or the ruler of them. The reason being is that at some point, you know, he made, he made his choice before somewhere in Genesis 3. Genesis 6 is where these other ones made some choices. They made some choices to come down and commit a grievous sin against humanity in Genesis 6. And then when these other Elohim that joined in this rebellion fell by their own choice, they entered into league with Satan in their joint rebellion and hatred against and at God, as well as having a same kind of heart of hate and rebellion toward humanity. God's the crown of God's creation. And they were in league together. They, they came together in this joint hatred of God and humanity. And so submitted themselves to him. And they were committed to sowing rebellion and hatred and chaos in this world against God. That's what they are committed to. As we said last week, Jesus declared the thief comes but to steal, kill, and to destroy. And so they are in league together. He is the prince, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, he is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Again, remember, Jesus said there's only two sides. You're either for me or you're against me. If you are not on the side of Christ, you are ruled by Satan. And he is at work in and through you to further his cause of hatred and rebellion against God. There are people, people say, well, I, that, that individual over there that doesn't claim to know Jesus, why? They're just a Buddhist or they're just a spiritual person. But they're very loving and they're very kind. Sure they are. If that's the way Satan can deceive them and keep them in rebellion against God and keep them from knowing the true Messiah, Jesus, and convince them to just by a, be a good, kind, loving person and everything's cool and okay, he will do that. But just let you stand up and declare that there's only one way to truly be at peace with God and have your sins forgiven, and that is through the gospel of Christ and believing in Him as Messiah, Lord, and Savior. You'll find out how loving they really are very quickly. They will accuse you of being intolerant, unloving, not gracious, narrow-minded, bigoted, racist. Why? Because they are under the power and the control of the evil one. If you don't belong to Christ, you belong to Satan. And Paul says he, it's the spirit that works in the sons of disobedience. He's in control of the heart of those who are not Christ's. Now, this villain has a very, very skillful motive and deception. Now, when he is at work, his motive is rebellion and hate. That's what he's, that's, that's his, that's where he operates from. That's the operating system in his being is rebellion and hate against God. He hates God. I mean, you, 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 you and I have no concept of, 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 of the devil's hatred for God. No concept. We see glimpses of it. You walk into a gas chamber in Auschwitz, you see a little glimpse of it. Because these are Jews. They gave birth to Messiah. They have to be wiped off the face of the earth. 
Just little glimpses here and there. But the core, it's hatred and rebellion. He is a rebel in every way. That is his motive. But when he is on operation, he has a method. And the method that he uses is deception and lies. He goes at the core of people's thought processes and plays upon that when he begins his assault and his attack. Look over, if you will, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because Paul outlines this for us, how this evil enemy acts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. It's strong terms. It's a war, Paul says. This isn't just a battle. This isn't a skirmish. This is a war. And we don't wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are mighty before God to the throwing down of strongholds throwing down imaginations and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Messiah. What Paul is describing there, he's describing a fortress. And that fortress is in the mind. And so this is what Satan does. Satan, you know, here's somebody, happy person, but he fires a thought or a belief into the mind of a human being, a lie, a deception, and he fires it long enough, educating them, reinforcing that thought, reinforcing that belief, that thought becomes, it literally, it becomes a belief. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just changed. It becomes a belief. That belief then takes shape. That belief takes shape in actions, deeds that people begin to do. Because it started with a thought, a deceptive thought that entered their mind that became a strong belief that resulted in actions that these people began to take or a way of life, things they began to do. They carry their thoughts out. They carry their beliefs out. This is where most of what we call isms come from in the world. Fascism. Socialism. Communism. Even capitalism. There are inherent things that are evil even within that many times. All the isms, religious, political, social, these are belief systems that lead people to actions. Now, him being a hater and a rebel against God, the thoughts and things that he's planting in people's minds, the beliefs, he wants to be inherently rebellious and hateful toward God, deceiving people, leading them astray, away from God, that are going to result in them doing things in the earth to one another and to others that will manifest this hatred and rebellion against God, against His authority, and against His ways. And Paul is telling us here that when we war, the good news of the gospel, the truth of the word of God, the truth of Christ, that powerful weapon that we have assaults those big powerful fortresses that are built in people's minds and begins to tear those things down, exposing the lies of their beliefs, revealing the sinfulness of their actions that the Holy Spirit then uses to an awareness to their mind and understanding of who Christ is and their need for Christ, they then humble themselves, repent of their sin, and trust Christ and join His kingdom as a result of the weapons that we use in the proclamation and declaration of the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit to destroy these false-isms that have deceived people. 
Paul, in the next chapter, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, says, I wish in verse 1 that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you do bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I married you to one husband that I might present you to a, as a pure virgin to Messiah, but I'm afraid that somehow as the serpent deceived Eve in his craftiness, so your what? Minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in the Messiah. Where is the war at? In the mind. What does Satan do? What, what has he done? Even in, we look at our own society. Where if, 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 again, you give someone who knows what they're doing, a child, for the first four to seven years of their life to educate them, to teach them, to train them, and instill things in their mind, and they will be yours for the rest of their life, barring the intervention of Jesus. People that, 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 that are very well-versed in psychology understand that, knowing how to train. An educational system that is anti-God, anti-Messiah, anti-truth, filling children's minds with lies that goes to a university system where that is just exploded. Where they come out of that university system thinking in ways totally contrary to the ways of God, questioning everything in the world, not any anymore. How many, how many Christian, quote-unquote, Christian kids, you know, that they were fine and dandy, you thought, all the way till they went off to college and came back? And then all of a sudden, they, they don't even believe in God anymore. They don't want anything to do with God anymore. They don't want it. Why? Because of the, the assault on the mind. Lies and deception. What you're seeing out on our streets today is the fruit of several generations being indoctrinated into socialism kind of thinking, communistic kind of thinking that is now manifested because of the belief in actions that are manifested in rebellion against authority. And again, rebellion is nothing more than the very heart of the adversary of God. It's what's happening. And the only, the only solution is not even laws. You can, you can make laws, and obviously God's given laws for restraint of evil, but it's not going to change the heart that's practicing evil. The only solution is for a person who has a wrong belief system is to be given a new heart, a new life through the gospel and the, the relationship with Jesus Christ. But the enemy is not stupid, and many of these people who are involved in all this stuff globally have an open allegiance to the devil. They're not shy about it. It's no longer something that they sweep, keep under the behind closed doors. They're, they're willingly and openly declaring their allegiance to Lucifer. They're not ashamed of it anymore. And they're more and more coming out of the closet about it. But the battle and the motive, his motive is murder. His motive is rebellion and hate, which leads to murder. But the place where the battle takes, is, takes place is in the mind which leads to actions that are in rebellion against God. And the murder that results is the destruction of humanity. When you turn your television on at night and you see the news and you see people standing out in front of burned storefronts that they've spent their lives, it's gone. You see the fruit of the enemy. Steal, kill, destroy. Leaving people hopeless. Leaving people with... Uh, with despair. So many of them now taking their lives. Lie after lie after lie. Deception after deception after deception. Which ultimately is going to culminate at some point in the ultimate rebellion. When it's unleashed without restraint on the earth. You think it's bad now. You haven't seen anything. This is kindergarten compared to what the Scripture says is coming. Once evil is unrestrained and allowed to run rampant in the earth, and it will be. When Revelation 9 talks about that bottomless pit being opened up and the spirits that are there that have been imprisoned up until this time are unleashed for a period of time on this earth, you have not seen anything to what's coming. 
It's all rebellion and hatred against God. Now, the truth is, this villain has been defeated. This villain was defeated in two specific places. First was the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus came into this world, the night he was born, as I've told you before, it was just like the paratroopers being dropped into France on June 6, 1944. That was the drop. He entered into enemy territory. And he knew it. And the enemy began immediately to try to annihilate and kill him. Herod's edict to destroy all the children. Throughout his life, all of those things. God the Father protected him, but he dropped into enemy territory. But we know what the ministry of Jesus was all about. Look, if you will, real quick into Acts chapter 10. i close in just a moment. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38 <clears throat> where Peter is preaching and he talks about Jesus coming. He talks about Jesus being the, the good news about Jesus, the Messiah being Lord of all. That people, they knew what had happened. And it talked about him being after he was baptized by his cousin John. He preached. He said, even Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He, everything he did, he was, he was going around people's lives, tearing their chains off, liberating them, setting them free, forgiving their sin, healing their bodies, opening blind eyes, raising dead bodies, casting demons out of people, liberating them, setting them free from the murder and mayhem of the evil one. That's what John said he came to do. John also tells us in the book of 1 John, he says in 1 John 3, 8, that the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. <laughs> that the reason why he was manifested, revealed among us, was to do exactly that, to destroy and crush the evil one. Remember, the original prophecy we read last week in Genesis 3, you, the enemy, would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but he would crush your head. And that's exactly what Jesus began to do in his ministry. But it was, there was not a culmination to it until his murder. When he was murdered on the cross, that was the undoing of the evil one. The evil one and all of the minions and forces of Satan did not know what the cross was all about. Paul tells us that in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 2, that if the rulers of this world had known what they were doing, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. They were complicit in their own destruction. They did not know that in his dying, the old Adam was dying and mankind was being liberated from sin. They didn't know that the sins of the world were being carried away by the one hanging on the cross and Satan would no longer have anything to accuse anyone of. They did not know that when he was laid in the grave, that death, because he was sinless, had no claim upon him, that the Lord of the realm of the dead could not hold him captive. And that he would march forth victoriously from that grave with the keys of Hades and death swinging at his side. And that when he would ascend, he would ascend to the right hand of the Father and all authorities, principalities, kingdoms, and dominion name would be under his feet. They didn't know that. Satan was defeated. This is why we read in the opening, John said, they overcame him. Why? How? By the blood of the Lamb. By the sacrifice of Christ. And by the word of their testimony. Remember, I've told you before, it's not, well, I got saved when I was nine years old. The word of your testimony is the good news of the gospel. 
The word of your testimony is the word of God. That's how we overcome now. We are more than conquerors now because he has conquered for us. And so this villain throughout the pages of Scripture that we see who's going to have one last gasp. It's kind of like somebody that's been mortally wounded and they're lying on the ground and they're dying. And they're fighting and struggling to stay alive. He'll have one last gasp that we see in the book of the Revelation of rebellion against God. He will try to have his own unholy trinity like God has the holy trinity. He will try to have a man of sin who will lead a rebellion just like Nimrod did against God. He will try. He will do all of that. But Revelation 19 says the heavens will be opened. The Son of Man will come forth riding on a white horse as it were with the armies of heaven behind him. And he will slaughter and destroy all of his adversaries and foes in the earth. And that dragon will be bound, chained, and cast forever into the pit of ruin, never to be heard from again. He's defeated. But the fact that he's defeated, again, remember, as I told you, dropping in in 1944, the Germans knew that it was their last gasp, and they said more, more casualties took place between June 1944 all the way to the end of the war than almost up to that point. They were fighting tooth and nail. It was their last gasp. That's why you see the things happening in the earth today. It's his last gasp. He's fighting tooth and nail, and he will take everyone down that he can with him because he is a rebel. He hates God, and he hates you. But you stand as a victorious warrior you do not have to be captive. You do not have to be a victim to his ploys or his lies. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. In Christ, nothing is impossible. All things are possible. You're not defeated. You stand victorious. But I will guarantee you this, when we do fall, and we are defeated, and we succumb in a battle, it always starts right there with a lie. And his craftiness to deceive us. That's why we have to be aware of the truth of who we are and what God has done for us in Messiah. Is that clear? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the victory that we have in Jesus. And we thank you for the fact that we are more than conquerors. And I pray for each person who is here and who's watching that you will give them the assurance, first and foremost, that they have a relationship with Jesus, that they're not currently on the wrong side. And that they will, if they don't know Christ, they will repent of their sin, that they will simply in their own heart cry out and ask you, Jesus, to be their Lord and Savior and trust you to be that for the forgiveness of their sins. And they will swear and give their allegiance to following you. Help us as your children to stand bold, to stand firm, and to fight the good fight of faith. Be faithful, as we read earlier, even unto the death. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay? Let's stand together as we sing the song in closing. Your name is wonderful. Your name is wonderful. Your name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, you are the mighty King, Master of everything. Your name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. You're the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God, you are. Bow down before you, love and adore you. Your name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. 
sing that one more time. Your name is wonderful. Your name is wonderful. Your name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, you are the mighty King, Master of everything. Your name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. You're the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God. As we go today, be blessed. If you uh, need prayer, you've been watching by way of internet, you feel free to comment in the section. Let us know. We can certainly be glad to pray for you. Any questions that you have, feel free to post those there as well. We'll do our best to answer those. And may the Lord bless you. May He protect you. May He make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His face upon you and give you His peace. May you be blessed. Go in Jesus' name. And are we victorious? Yes, we are. You go out and live that victory, all right? Be blessed as you go.